Hey, we got a great show for you today. We're getting into some mid-round picks we think can help you win your league. There's so much camp hype going on. We're going to help decide whether there's smoke or fire or what to do with it. Stay tuned, like, and subscribe. All right, all right, all right. It's almost that time of year. The time when I set the foundation for supreme and total dominance at my fantasy football draft. How can I be so confident? Because I used the ultimate draft kit from the fantasy footballers. Man, it updates all off season, so I never worry about using old busted information. Consistency charts, auction values, full projections. Oh baby, this thing's got it all. If you want to keep it 100 for your draft, Head to ultimatedraftkit.com and get your copy today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh! Welcome in. Tuesday, August 3rd, Jason Moore, Mike Wright, Andy Holloway, the fantasy footballers, back again. Jam-packed Tuesday episode. Oh, jam-packed. That's, that's what that I said. A, that was intense, man. Yeah, I'm a little scared. The people need to know that How this packed. thing is packed with jam. <laughs> you got jam. You got jam. <laughs> nice. I like how we ended up there. Uh, we have mid-round madness on the show today. We've each picked out a couple of mid-round players that we think will uh, help your team, provide a lot of upside, shouldn't be going where they're going. Uh, that's Brooks, that's rounds five through eight. Is that what we decided yeah. on? Okay. Yes, sir. And it's then, tough, man. Those the middle rounds, they're you're panning. You are panning for gold. You are sifting because there's a lot of a lot of mucky muck, a lot of silt. Yeah, but there's that, some nuggets in but there. But is there a Stefan Diggs yes. out there? That's what came to mind right away was the sixth round, Stefan Diggs. Uh we have NFL news to talk about. Uh watched Kenny Galladay grab his hamstring today in training yeah. camp, so that's a good time. And we have where there's smoke, there's fire. So we're going to be going into some of these camp hype news blurbs and letting you know whether we believe what's going on because there's been a lot of it. Uh, I just saw Mike will start. I mean, this isn't part of the segment, but I always have to get your commentary on Zach Ertz. And <laughs> apparently um, he's having a great training camp. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, Yeah. We've uh, we've heard from a... A beat reporter over there that Zach Ertz is having great training tramp, training camp. The idea he has done is so silly. Uh, I'm not sure how much Zach Ertz they watched from last year. I don't know if he unlocks some sort of superpower by. I mean, he, maybe he had a fountain of youth when he decided I'm going to look like I'm from the year 1998 with my bleached blonde hair. I'm going to I'm going to go full slim shady. Maybe he well, unlocked some uh, some superpowers look, here. Look, when you pull up in your Miata with your <laughs> blonde hair, you have a certain level of confidence that you're reborn in a way. But yeah, look, he got maybe he got his swag back. But I, I hate, don't know. I hate to even bring it up, but like Devontae Smith just got hurt, and they don't have other receivers, and he's established. And now a report of a great training camp is he being foolishly overlooked? No. <laughs> not, yeah, prob not probably not. I mean, uh, the, the reality is. He's going to have targets. You know, he's he's going to be a part of this offense, much to Mike's chagrin. And Dallas Goddard's chagrin. Right. That's that's the that's suckier the bigger part. One. But um but he was never a supreme athlete. Um he was a very solid receiver and now So that's even more of an argument that he'll be fine. If you're never a supreme athlete and you were always relying you on still, targets. But whatever you started at, you still get older and worse from Look, that starting J point. Jason Witten at one point retired from being an athlete and was still in the NFL <laughs> and still effective. That's my only point is like Jason Witten is the template 
of sure. being check down friendly, PPR friendly. Um, and, and perhaps last year was an outlier, uh, but I mean, it wasn't. <laughs> no, no, he's got stats. No, no, no. They, well, I'm saying that like he had incredible volume last year. I mean, he averaged six and a half targets a game, and he was useless for fantasy football. So he, he may exist simply to cause pain. Possible. Uh, to those that, that hope for Dallas Goddard, to those that you know hope for any of the other wide receivers to have a large target share. And for Mike, specifically for Mike. And, and he saw how much pain he was causing the world, so he figured, when I look in the mirror, I need to feel pain myself. Oh, with the, the hair? Yeah, that was the decision. Uh, I'm, I'm in. You're in? No, no! Like Andy's it? on the oh, bleach fire hair. I'm in on anything different. <laughs> Just give me something different. I guess we know your Halloween costume this year. Oh, no! <laughs> I could probably Put do it that. on the list! I can do that. I got better start growing, growing it yeah, out you a little grow bit. Yeah, you got to grow it out. All right, ultimatedraftkit.com. Make sure you check out the draft kit. I, I sent out a, uh, an email to everybody who already purchased it, reminding you, you have full access on the app as well as the web. So uh, we just added the draft analyzer to the app so you can get your grade from us on your upcoming drafts, uh, play around with it, put in different players. It's a very valuable tool to get you going. We updated 137 players yesterday in the Ultimate Draft Kit. So camp has started. Uh, depth charts are shifting. It, it was kind of a formal audit of our rankings, like heading into camp season. Very excited about that, but that's at ultimatedraftkit.com. We have a great article on the website, uh, Matt DeSorbo's Fantasy Football Mythbuster series. You can check that out at thefantasyfootballers.com. Let's get this show on the road. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Presented by Traeger Grills. Three storylines, and we'll decide if it's just smoke or there's some fire. Number one, Melvin Gordon as the Broncos running back one. Last week, respected beat writer Benjamin Al Albright um, talked about the fact that, here's his quote, one thing that's being glossed over, I think, uh, is that Melvin Gordon is clearly the RB1 for this team so far at camp. Mm -hmm. So this was something that in the very, very beginning of the offseason, I had great conviction of, that Gordon was going to be a value, that Gordon was going to be valuable. But my conviction, I'll admit, softened tremendously through the course of the offseason, um, often at the hands of beat writers. You said yeah. Javonta Williams is like he's – it's inevitable, right? He is inevitable. Yeah, very much like Thanos, and to me, this is this is both. Uh, and I'm uh, let me explain that. I don't think that it's just blowing smoke that Melvin Gordon opening up camp is the starting running back. I mean, we're you know, we're not even a full week in to that point. They're going to let the veteran be the guy. But I agree with the the other beat reporters saying that Javante Williams. There is a plan for this player. They traded up. In the second round, like a very high second round draft pick. This is very similar to uh, Jonathan Taylor last year. I mean, almost an identical situation where the team traded up in the second round. You know that there's a plan for this player. Uh, now, the ADP of Jonathan Taylor, in my opinion, last year got out of control and was kind of bailed out by a. It was bailed out by the injury. By a Marlon Mack injury in week one. So, it, luckily, Javante Williams' ADP is not getting up into that fourth round, at least not yet. But I, I still strongly believe that sooner than later, this will be 1A, 1B, and then Javante Williams will be sliding into be the 1A. Melvin Gordon is not young at all. He is, uh, he is not the future for this team. Well, uh, but he was very effective, Jason. Smoke or fire? This is fire. I mean, I I really believe this is this is fire. I I made the case before this that you know this is a team. You you say Javante is inevitable. Absolutely correct. Javante is inevitable. Uh, it's just a matter of what's the timeline here. Because next year, next year this is Javante's team, and they're going to have a quarterback, and this is going to be a great franchise. Uh, to root for, great for fantasy. That's a bold statement to say they'll have a quarterback. It, it bold, and it will be true. Um, okay. However, this year they have a very capable Melvin Gordon. You, you know, he ran for four point six yeah, he was last good. year. He was really good. He was really good. Uh, he was the center of their offense and and catch the ball. 
he can catch the ball and he's on a contract year like run him into the ground you don't need him at all for your future you could protect Javante and keep in mind like Philip Lindsay is gone and and Royce Freeman was will probably you know that's that's almost 150 carries so if Javante comes in and has 150 carries as a rookie Melvin Gordon could still have his 215 he had last year so I really do believe that Melvin Gordon is the starter this year um we're going to talk about the rookie process and the transition. You're right, Mike. Like as the season goes on, they'll probably give more and more work to uh, the rookie as he, you know, becomes more veteran. Um, I I really wonder what last season would have looked like for Jonathan Taylor had Marlon Mack not been bailed out. Because right. I mean, they. Uh, but but you never know. Marlon Mack number what twenty on Madden's running back ratings. <laughs> Higher rating than Jonathan he's, Taylor. Yeah. He's so good. Post uh, I, I have to go fire here. Uh, I still have Melvin Gordon ranked as a top 24 running back uh, right at 24. So I'll go fire there. Mike is the lowest. He has Melvin Gordon down at 43. I know we're going to talk more about him later this week, so we'll leave it there. Uh, Terrace, no, second uh, smoke fire here. Terrace Marshall. The Athletic is reporting that Terrace Marshall is a candidate to replace Curtis Samuel in the slot. Well, yeah, I think we Wait, knew what? that. I think we knew that. <laughs> the guy they drafted <laughs> has a chance to play. <laughs> Football. So let, let to me replace the guy yeah. who's no longer on the team. Let me re let me rephrase it for us. Okay. Um, will Terrace Marshall have a significant role and one that might indict the value of DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson in the offense? Smoke or fire? Marshall's one of my favorite players coming into this uh, into this draft and into the season. Shining in camp, we. Had rookies make a big impact last year, whether it's T. Higgins, Justin Jefferson. What do you believe about Terrace Marshall? Is this is there fire here? Well, if you it depends on what the fire is. This is a, this is a low this is, is a it, low heat. Well, T. Is Higgins a, fire because, or Justin Jefferson fire? Uh, more definitely more T. Higgins, but I don't even think it's T. Higgins level. But that's actually a good comp because you had. Uh, AJ Green and you had uh, Tyler Boyd there so maybe T Higgins is is a good comp here you're coming in replacing Curtis Samuel I don't think he's going to rookie year be as good as Curtis Samuel but I do think that where there is fire is that he is going to replace David Moore like they signed David Moore early in the offseason to replace Curtis Samuel then they go into the draft draft Terrace Marshall and they're like oh yeah that dude's way better and, and I think I mean because that's what the the beat reporters are actually talking about is that that battle as to who is the wide receiver three, and it will be Terrace Marshall. I, I I believe that. I've only I've only ever viewed David Moore on the outside with the kind of deep threat he was with Russell Wilson. So um, I have lowered. Like I think it's fire. Like I think Terrace Marshall was brought in to be the next big thing in Carolina at the wide receiver position. Jason has the most confidence in Sam Darnold in general, but. Robbie Anderson, this is going to be the last year he's in Carolina. And so I think Marshall will have a role. And I think, you know, talent rises to the top. And it's one of the reasons why I've softened a little bit on uh, Robbie. So I'll go with uh, the smoke leading to fire here. Mike, what do you think? I will go. Uh, I'm still not 100% sure what we are arguing for. But like Terrace Marshall, if the if the statement is, Will Terrace Marshall That's why I changed truly it to... negatively impact Robbie Correct. Anderson or DJ Moore? I would call that smoke. Okay. I think that Robbie Anderson, uh, having been reunited with a former coach, really uh, using a skill set that we had not seen from Robbie Anderson, the, the, the Jets had pegged him simply as a deep threat, and uh, Matt Ja Rule said, no, <gasps> you, you, this, is, Murder. this is a PPR type of guy. Uh, is uh, and as Terrace Marshall acclimates, he will be. I'm with you. I Terrace Marshall is, uh, going to be great. I I truly believe in him as a player, but I don't think that I I think it's Robbie and DJ Moore solid. Uh, Terrace Marshall won't season. be a thousand yard guy. All right, and then the last uh the last one here. Here we go. AJ Green receiving a lot of hype in camp. Mike Jarecki, yes, it's been two practices. Um. AJ Green making play after play. Peter Schrager came out, says, I know it's just seven on seven. He looks incredible out there. Um, I've watched. I'll, I'll add a note here. I don't know if you guys saw this one. You know who else was uh, 
Singing the praises. Stoking the, the fire. DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah. DeAndre Hopkins came out and said he is the best wide receiver I have played with. He followed that up quickly saying, I know you guys are going to – well, you're played with Larry and Andre Johnson, and he was highlighting simply – out playing with those guys at the end of their careers. And Hopkins was simply reinforcing, I don't think A.J. Green is at the end of his career. He is, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, look. Hopkins, he is. A.J. Green is the same age as Julio Jones. Both of them, I think you look at in the twilight of their career or you know, certainly not their peak, right? Um, whether or not they have a, some level of plateau or – whatever you want to call it, with Julio and A.J. Green. It's been a long time since we've seen it from A.J. Green. Um, I, You guys know where I'm at yeah, here. Of course we know where I, you are. I, I, and I, I'm unabashed in the reality. Like I think A.J. Green will make a tremendous impact for the Arizona Cardinals this year. I have been an apologist for him. Last year, he, he was, you know, we brought it up. Mike, you brought it up. He's He had the lowest amount of catchable passes last season, 49%. I've talked about the, the problems with separation numbers because – Players like A.J. Green or Allen Robinson, they always have the same level of separation, even in their peak years, which is not a huge amount. Like, that's just not who they are. That's not who Kenny Galladay is. That is what Stephon Diggs is. That is what, you know, some of these other wide receivers are. Sure. And I just don't think the way we measure separation is meaningful for fantasy uh, predictions. So I think because of it, the, the belief here is not that A.J. Green will be reborn into his peak. The belief here is that he will get every snap as the number two wide receiver as long as he's healthy, and he's in one of the top offenses in all of football that will run the most plays. It's the same argument you guys both made for Kyler Murray being the number one wide or a quarterback mm -hmm. in fantasy is the amount of plays and the, the talented offense. So I think Adrian Green will score a bunch, and I think he will be meaningful. So I – look, I want to call him the people's 11th round pick. <laughs> You can call him whatever you want. <laughs> because I think everybody should draft A.J. Green. Every single person. Well, 100%. I mean, technically, only one person per league can draft him. I think one person per league should draft him in the 11th round. And So uh, you, you should and the 1101. That's what you're saying A.J. Green should be. I, I'm just saying that's where he's going. He's going to go there Mr. or later. Mr. 1101. 1101. So you will draft him in every 11th round that I you're will in. Play. That's what you're saying. I w absolutely. Okay, and that, uh, that makes sense. I, and, and what what do you what does it cost you? Eleventh round 11 pick. I mean, come yeah, we, on. I I and he's hope, the number two in the one of the best offenses in football. I hope that this is fire. Um, <laughs> I don't believe that it is fire. I think this is a very very low smoke. Like a I'm making jerky, which <laughs> makes a lot of sense for AJ Green at this stage in his career. Uh, you know, shriveled and old and and dried out. Um. He's 33 oh, years old. He hasn't done anything in years, and he's not in pads yet. So I, I hope it's true. I'm calling it smoke. Uh, for what it's worth, DeAndre Hopkins did not fuel the Rondale Moore hype train. Their young draft pick. He says he has a lot to improve on to impress me. So far, he's done nothing. Oh Whoa! yeah, <laughs> yeah, Whoa! Get body. So I mean, good for you, Hopkins. Yeah, he's he's giving. Got to teach them young whippersnappers. Yeah, tell, tell the young man to sit down. He's giving some. <laughs> Which is funny because he's actually made a couple headlines big plays as well. in yeah. in camp. So uh, didn't feel didn't, that was from John uh, Wine for us, by the way, uh, on Twitter. Oh my goodness! So uh, there you go. We, you know. It's inevitable that I'll talk about AJ Green every offseason. Uh, that was Where There's Smoke, There's Fire, presented by our friends by the way, at Traeger Grills. I'll go fire. Th oh, thanks for I'm asking. I'm sorry, Mike. Thanks for, I'm a part of this show, I'm too. sorry. Would you like to expound? No, I would not. <laughs> I will keep my opinions to myself. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, a reminder, put that Traeger wet wood pellet grill in your starting lineup. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, make every game day delicious. And even, I can taste it. Even though we're saying where there's smoke, there's fire I, on the Traeger, I recommend smoking things. <laughs> oh, it, uh, they're great. <laughs> yeah, it's outstanding. Um, head to Traeger.com slash footballers to discover how simple wood-fired cooking can be. You know, we talk a lot about it, but I think Al Borland might be the master of them all. The grill, the Traeger grill He's master? He's the grill master, smoke master. Although Jason would fight him for that title. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I would, and we'll we'll find out uh, in a grill to the death. That's what. We'll oh do. my goodness! <laughs> I don't know if Traeger wants to sponsor that. <laughs> but uh, let's talk news. 
news and notes from around the league. Presented by Sleeper. You guys want to talk about A.J. Green? Mike, what are your thoughts on smoke fire with A.J. Green? I, I really want to know your opinion. I think he will absolutely outproduce his ADP. Now, does that turn into a top 36 wide receiver that you're happy to, to flex? Most of the time, that remains to be seen. That was by far the most valuable <laughs> sentence on A.J. Green this show has had today. Uh, Matthew Stafford exited Monday's practice after hitting his throwing thumb on a player's helmet. That's really concerning because this is uh, possibly a reaggravation of what he dealt with last year. And, and if that's the case, then you we got to keep our eyes on this and it would be bad vibes all the way around for the injured Rams right now. Yeah, Stafford had off-season surgery to repair a torn ligament in the same thumb. Seems likely that it is so, a re-aggravation. Let's, yeah, let's hope not. Mike, you know, hold on to something. Oh. Washington head coach Ron Rivera told the media Monday morning that the turf toe injury that slowed Antonio Gibson last year is no longer an issue. You're darn right. You're darn right. It's gonna get You've always of, believed in his toes, Mike. He's, oh, oh, the great. longevity he's, of his toes. He's got great toes. They're, yeah. they're incredibly strong, uh, <laughs> bear-like, I might say. And he, there was also another quote. Do bears have toes? I think, do, do paws have toes? <laughs> Is the bigger question here. Jason, have you ever looked at your dog's feet? Yes. Do they yeah, he, he's do wondering, they, do they, are, are they, they called in, toes? Is I'm what he, saying, I'm of saying. That, are they all toes, though, on all, like, are there no fingers? I feel like a paw doesn't have toes. They're all, they're all toes, It's right? got to be a toe, because it's a foot. But are there, they have four feet. So it's all toes. Yes, it's exactly. all toes, no you don't, fingers. You don't call it their arms and their legs on a dog. It's their four legs. Yeah, what you do you not have to worry about any bare fingers. Look, they have phalanges. Right. I think. Bare phalanges. Look, I'm confident that they're toes. Are you researching this I right am, now? I am. And the This paws, is the second all... bear related question to come up, like science wise. <laughs> we learned that bears live to be 25 to 30 years old. Uh, and that? generally, pause have generally four load-bearing digital pads, although there could be five or six toes. Yes. Okay, they are toes. In the case of domestic cats and bears. <laughs> so, all right. We've, you we've, feeling better now? I'm feeling great. Thank so, you. So what I was going to say is there was a, another quote uh, it, uh, also talking about Antonio Gibson's pass-catching ability will be the key to unlocking the playbook. There's more, uh, more smoke here for Antonio Gibson. All right, Kenny Galladay walked off the field with the trainer after having his first target stripped in seven on seven. We watched this play right before uh, the show started, and to me, it looked like he grabbed his hamstring. He did, and so which was the first of the injuries he dealt with last year. He then later dealt with a hip that we kept waiting for him to come back. Uh, I regretted trading him, thinking he's going to come back mm -hmm. quickly, and then he never did. So camp hamstring injuries are awful, but we can hamstring injuries. Yeah, there you Ooh, go. Ooh, well done. Uh, it, we'll, we'll see what the grade is. You know, hopefully it's just a grade one. He'll take some time off and he'll come back and he'll be perfectly fine. But the, he missed out on the full team brawl with Daniel Jones at the bottom of the pile. Mm, that's are you happened joking? a little bit later. And Joe Judge was very mad at it. Yeah, I can imagine. The, I was now they're going to say, run. He's running them. Oh, yeah. There's there's talk of a lot of laps happening. Uh, In Joe Judge, camp? Yeah, Joe oh, Judge. Oh, Judge very and jury over school. there. Oh, I, I can't imagine the players are very happy about this. But camp is not going great. Uh, one beat reporter uh, commented that they're, they've seen a, a lot of of uh, end zone fades and wide receiver screens. That seems to be a priority right now, both of which are very low expected value plays. The end zone fade is like the stupidest play in football. It was created back when uh, defenders didn't even realize that you were allowed to throw the ball. So it's just... Yeah, what's it, funny the end about, zone fade is one of those things where you go, does my team have uh, Devontae Adams? Yes or no? Check box. Yeah, if yes... Throw whatever you want. Well, if, if no, if, don't. But on top of that, do I have a absolute pinpoint quarterback throwing the ball? And Aaron Rodgers, yeah. Okay, maybe every once in a while throw a fade in the end zone. But other than that, stop doing it. Yeah, I, I think Jason's right. It's it's something that has become the norm, but it only really fits certain athletes. Like if you have Jimmy Graham, check the box, do it. If you have Larry Fitzgerald in his peak, do that. 
Terrell but, Owens. But otherwise... So the larger point is uh, Giants camp is going swell. Yeah. And this injury, we're going to have to watch it because, yep. you know, Kadarius Tony is waiting in the wings. He is back. He is practicing off of the COVID list. All right. That was today's news and notes presented by Sleeper. Make sure you check out their platform. It's the best place to host your league. They've got dynasty leagues and lots of great stuff on the sleeper platform always changing and before we get to the mid-round madness one of oh, today's I can't wait. sponsors first leaf i want to thank first leaf because i love me a good glass of wine and first leaf is where i get all of my wine personally and uh, i absolutely love it it's great they just ship it right to your door uh, you fill out this little survey saying what kinds you like, what flavors you like, uh, what you don't like, and then they tailor it to you. I go in, I rate the wines I like, and so, you know, the draft season's coming up. Everyone else got their beers around the table. Get, grab a glass of wine. Take it up a Be notch. Be sophisticated. Be sophisticated. Show them, show them what class looks like at a, at a draft table. Uh, and and they can they can really tailor it to your liking. It, everything is is fantastic. I've never had a bad wine, and their customer service is absolutely phenomenal. So look, whether you're by the water grilling with friends or taking it easy at home, First Leaf is the perfect summer staple. Join today, and you can get six bottles of wine for twenty nine ninety five and free shipping. Just go to tryfirstleaf.com slash footballers. That's six bottles of wine for twenty nine ninety five and free shipping at tryfirstleaf.com slash footballers. Foot Clan, we'd like to thank Indochino for sponsoring today's show. The right outfit can bring out something special in us. And with Indochino, creating your best look yet could be more affordable than you think. It may have been a while since the last time you've had an excuse to dress up. Yeah, uh, that I think that's true for all of us. But whenever the next chance is, make the absolute most of it with Indochino. Could you wear those to like a nice dining restaurant? Of oh, course yeah. you could. Okay. Absolutely you can. I have an, know. I have an Indochino suit. I went down to the showroom. I got fitted. The process was fantastic. I felt safe through the entire thing. And it was done lickety split. And then before you know it, a, a fully tailored suit customized where you get to choose a whole bunch of things. It's not just, oh, I want that color. The, there are so many suits to choose from. And this thing, I put this on and talk about sophistication. Like my off the charts, I felt. He got an honorary doctorate five minutes after he put the suit on. Yeah, it just showed up at yeah. the front door. And they said, this is for the, the sharp dressed man in the Indochino <laughs> suit. It's also very affordable, highly recommended. Indochino is now open at select Nordstrom stores, giving you even more ways to get great fitting and personalized clothing. Visit or find your nearest location at Indochino.com. And right now, you can get $50 off any purchase of $3.99 or more by using the code FOOTBALLERS at checkout. That's $50 off a purchase of $3.99 or more at I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O.com. Promo code FOOTBALLERS. This is blasphemy. This is madness. This is the middle rounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, mid round madness. We've each picked out two names to bring to light here on today's episode. We'd love to hear from you if you uh, on Twitter, YouTube, wherever you're listening. If you agree with these names, uh, if you disagree, uh, don't comment. Uh, but no, I'm kidding. All right, here we go. I'm going to start. AJ Green. <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's, not, that's, not, that's, not, that's not mid rounds. It's <laughs> not borderline undrafted. I'm going to start right here. Oh! oh. Debo Samuel. You're bringing it back. I'm bringing Debo back, baby. Especially after that comment he made about uh, Trey Lance's abilities. Do you, oh, yes. Says he's got balls. <laughs> mm. Mm. Thank you, deep, Debo. Deep balls are. <laughs> All right, Debo Samuel is my first mid-round madness pick. Depending on where you're checking ADP, he's somewhere in the uh, late seventh, early eighth round. And uh, I brought him up before, early in the offseason. Look, the key for Debo Samuel is health. Why do I like him? I like him because he's a better value in drafts than Brandon Ayuk, and I believe he is a valuable, game-scripted piece of the offense. Uh, when all things are equal in this offense – 
I believe that Kyle Shanahan has displayed a trust of Debo Samuel. He has also built game plans around him. And when he's on the field, when he plays 70-plus percent of snaps, he has been double-digit fantasy points-wise 11 out of the last 13 games he's played. That's 85% of the time. That is rock solid. And so when I look at Debo and I see mid-round value, late seventh, early eighth, instead of a fifth-round pick on Brandon Ayuk, to me that jumps off the page. Um, both players were injured last year. Brandon Ayuk missed some time. Debo missed more time. Obviously, Kittle and the entire offense missed time. But the the plan for Debo Samuel for your fantasy team is that you are you are drafting somebody that when he's healthy, you can start. That is what I believe about Debo Samuel. You can put him in your starting lineup, and he's a seventh-round pick, eighth-round pick. Um, so let me ask you guys, though, Okay. based on that, uh, I guess, analysis, Debo or – some of these other names that are similar in ADP. Debo or Juju. We talked about him yesterday. Who would you take? Debo. Agreed. What about Devonta Smith with the MCL news and not knowing when he'll get acclimated? Yeah, uh, if you had asked me a week ago, I, I might have gone Devonta Smith. But with the MCL, I would be forced to go, you know, you, I want to stay away from injury, so I'll go Debo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who is healthy, and if you look at the camp reports right now, targets have been dominated by Debo and Ayuk. So they've they've basically both led camp and targets, and then the next highest target is down at, you know, they're both at like 13, 14 in camp practices. Next one's down yeah, at six. George Kittle not impressing at camp. Are we concerned? No. Yeah. I just you want to know why? Because he's also, he's a, also man. a man. Yes. All right, real quick, Jerry, Judy or Debo? Debo. Yeah, all right. And then – uh We'll make the transition here. Debo Ooh. or Robbie Anderson? Uh, I'm going Robbie Anderson, but these guys are back to back. And we don't care about Mike's opinion. So. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> these guys are back to back, and Robbie Anderson is my mid round madness pick. Um, Ooh, back to back. And they're going back to back in the draft. And, and the way that I see these two guys is really upside versus safety. Uh, Debo Samuel has, you know, the upside, the swing for the fences. If you went safe in those early rounds, then maybe you would go with Debo here. If you ended up drafting CD Lamb or Terry McLaurin, kind of swinging for the fences early, then grab Robbie Anderson in the seventh round because he is extremely safe and extremely mispriced because there's this thought that, uh, you know, Sam Darnold is bad. Sure, there's a thought that Sam Darnold is bad. Sam Darnold might be as bad as Teddy Bridgewater was last year. They were basically just like each other. They they threw the ball short. They didn't throw a lot of touchdowns. So, I mean, that you know, r his range of outcomes is, you know, I think very, very good. Here's my argument for Robbie Anderson. This is a player that got 136 targets, 1,100 yards, but only scored three touchdowns. I mean, 95 receptions and 1,100 yards. Yeah, that's wild. The, think about how safe Robert Woods feels. When you're early in your draft, and I want to make I sure I'm protected. I love that comparison. Robert Woods had fewer targets, 129, fewer receptions, 90, only 936 yards. Versus Robbie Anderson smoking those numbers, but he only had three touchdowns, which is absolutely an outlier when you look at yards per touchdowns he should have been more around six seven touchdowns if it comes up to five you're you're happy I mean like Robert Woods he's not a touchdown guy and you feel safe but you pay a lot more for Woods um you lose Curtis Samuel and and yes you got Terrace Marshall coming to town but I don't think Terrace Marshall is going to be twice what Curtis Samuel was Curtis Samuel was was great you also have him, Mike, you brought up he's reunited with his college coach. That's true. They plugged him in and did a lot more with Robbie last year. Now he's reunited with his quarterback that, that he you know had some great production with um, in Sam Darnold. So the combination of the fact that you've got a guy with that much volume, with a coach who knows how to use him, and a quarterback that he is friends with, at this value in the seventh round, I mean, over the last five years, the wide receiver 34, which is where he's being drafted, averages between 133 and 155 fantasy points. If Robbie Anderson loses 15 receptions from last year, loses 100 yards, and finishes with only five touchdowns, he would be basically the wide receiver 24. He would outperform that if he sucks 
from last year. What if he just does what he did last year and maybe scores an average amount of touchdowns? He's he's like wide receiver 15, and you're getting him in the seventh round. I think he is as, just about as safe as it comes for this area in your draft, and I, I grab him. I mean, you've seen the mock drafts. I, yeah. I literally grab him every time I can. It's funny, and Mike, I want to know, since they're back-to-back -back in drafts and we each picked one of them, I would love to know who you would select. Uh, I know from having Robbie last year, the lack of touchdowns was tough. Like he had two games inside the top 20 after week one. That was tough because you just kept waiting for that touchdown. But the volume numbers Jason brings up, they're tremendous. In fact, I, I hate to do this, but like your argument for Robbie, like do you have DJ Moore or Robbie ranked higher? I have DJ Moore ranked slightly higher. So you're looking at Robbie. He, would you consider him the wide receiver two for that team? I consider him the wide receiver one for the team because I look at wide receiver okay. one as as target volume. Okay. Yeah. But for, for fantasy purposes, wide receiver two. Yeah, and so, Mike, I, who do you think? I mean, Chris, Christian McCaffrey's coming back, but Curtis Samuel left. Yeah, the, yeah, the Christian McCaffrey point is valid, although Mike Davis saw a whole bunch of targets uh, in replacement at the running back position. And, I mean, funny enough, my projections are – Wide receiver 31, Robbie Anderson. Wide receiver 32, Debo Samuel. Ha -ha! So, for projections-wise, I've got Robbie clearly in the lead here by probably like half a point or so. Uh, so, it, it'll come down to roster construction. I mean, I, I think that the ceiling is is higher for Debo. I'm, I'm projecting that Brandon Ayuk is the guy for San Francisco, but leave a little bit of room for that to be an incorrect – uh, assumption for the team, and if Debo comes back and he is the number one guy, he w he would be more valuable than Robbie Anderson, who I don't I consider Robbie Anderson the wide receiver two of the team, even though he gets uh, more targets. Last year on this show, a couple of our mid round madness picks: Kareem Hunt in the late fifth ended up the RB ten, Ronald Jones in the sixth ended up the RB sixteen, and then this next guy. Oh, he's back? Mike's, he was in last year, He was too? in last year's because this is where he lives. What are, yeah. we, what are we doing? And he finished as the wide receiver nine, Mike. Take it away. It's Tyler Lockett, people. Wide receiver from the Seattle Seahawks. Over the last three years, we have seen Tyler Lockett get better every single Hot year. In, ter Lockett. in terms of receptions Ooh. and targets, he went from 57 to 82 to 100. Tyler Lockett had 100 receptions last year, and here he is in the back of the fifth round. He has had double-digit touchdowns in two of the last three years, and the one he didn't hit 10, he hit eight. He is Pathetic. A, he is a sensational player, and in those three seasons, uh, Russell Wilson is averaging 35 passing touchdowns a year. Russ, even if the passing volume goes down, is an efficient touchdown player thrower and Tyler Lockett is a huge benefactor for that Tyler Lockett actually saw more targets than Metcalf if you want to go Jason with the 132 is Tyler Lockett the number one wide receiver for Seattle uh, the number one target <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's similar it's similar right like they are right. more targeted but the less explosive athlete I agree with that and you want to talk about end zone targets you know DK Metcalf he lives there both had 14 end zone targets. I mean, the, the the disparity between Tyler Lockett's ADP and DK Metcalf's ADP is is out of control to me. And yes, consistency of Tyler Lockett, it is a problem. I I don't disagree with with people talking about that. I don't disagree with us bringing it up all the time because over the second half it was rough. It was also a little bit rough for DK Metcalf's fantasy value as well. But it's the fifth round. Think of that. This is your fifth starter. This is possibly your wide receiver three. If you, you can go running back, running back, and three straight wide receivers, this is your third guy, and he has been a top 15 wide receiver each it's, of the last three years. It's so interesting. Like, There's almost no more interesting player than Tyler Lockett to me because, I mean, he was on the Mid-Round Madness show last year. Mm -hmm. Fifth round pick, or seventh pick of the fifth round last year. He produced his highest Wait, fantasy. Wait, the seventh pick? He was the so he's going later this year. This is my, yeah, that's my point. <laughs> he, he goes 507, uh, finishes ninth, goes 510. He's had three years in a row where his fantasy finish has gone up. But I think it speaks to the burns. It mm -hmm. speaks to the pain. It speaks to the, 
like the week after week of leaving him, like he established himself in your roster. He basically spent the first, uh, what was it, like, I don't know, six weeks, and he, he cemented, like literally yes. cemented himself into your wide receiver spot where you couldn't pull him out. And that, so it, the truth is, is that is an emotional reaction. The ADP is an emotional reaction that is a slightly disproportionate. Like if you want to opt out of him because you don't want to risk the possibility of doing that, sure. But 100 receptions, he's basically what Robbie Anderson did, only he scored touchdowns. Right. He had 100 receptions and about 1,000 yards. He's not going to put up huge yardage games. But he will score because he has Russell Wilson, and not Sam Darnold. Volume is more important than consistency when projecting consistency. So that that might sound confusing, but if you just yeah, look very at how much. you if, got jammed, <laughs> if you look at how consistent a player has been, and you try to say, well, that's how consistent they will be on a week by week basis, that is a actually a poor metric to use by comparison to volume and he had a hundred receptions so like Tyree Kill used to be thought of as the super inconsistent player um it, Michael Thomas the most consistent guy ever if you go back before his wide receiver one finish the year prior super yes. inconsistent but he had the volume and the next thing you know they're a consistent player I think that's I, why I a play this. sorry I think that's why a player like DJ Moore has been difficult to project and 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 difficult to look at consistently because he's in the 60s in total receptions despite the explosiveness yeah and and the last thing I would say on Tyler Lockett which obviously we know I love Tyler Lockett but there's this feeling like he is an afterthought now DK Metcalf is in town and he's the the old has been for the Seahawks and they're moving on from him he just signed a four-year, $69 million contract. It was super nice, and he is I'm ready to I'm glad you brought it up because I, I have it pulled up right in front of me to point out that Tyler Lockett just signed a – they just gave him another big bag of money. He is he is locked in, locked it in, and in the back of the fifth round – so, Andy, to speak to your point of, yeah, he cemented himself in, and then I get it. There was the burns in the second half of – of the season but mentally prepare yourself this is your this is your fifth positional player and they are going to be a little bit he's going to be volatile but you can't win a race you, you can't win a drag race if someone else is throwing nos in there and they have a, some you know volatile compounds helping them a, a get a greater score or speed you need that in fantasy football yeah, you not, have to have a not, mix. not every player on your team can just be a floor safety player well or, you, it, or it, you'll be right in the middle it's a perfect transition for my next guy because he represents the nos for your team uh who actually ended up very consistent last year but it's will fuller of the miami dolphins yeah will fuller is currently going in the middle of the eighth round that is the wide receiver 37 this is for a player who i think that there's a couple of uh, emotional reactions that is deterring people from drafting him he was the fifth most consistent wide receiver last year he was the number one most efficient player. He was uh, number one in terms of number fires net expected points per target. You target Will Fuller, you get more fantasy points than any other player in the league per target. Um, he had an outstanding year that was cut short by the, the PED suspension, which leads into this year like he's not out there week one. Mm -hmm. Now he goes to a team where there's a lot of, I guess, unbelief on the potential and ability of of Tua to go out there and stretch the ball or stretch the field. Uh, he can't <laughs> I'm stretch the make ball. This ball two yards <laughs> long. And so, uh, but you you guys have heard me talk about Tua this off season. Not that I'm predicting greatness, but that I'm basically saying we don't have enough information on Tua to declare him not an elite quarterback or somebody capable of getting the ball to players down the field. This year they go out, they add Jalen Waddle, they add Will Fuller. Right, this is a huge signing. They add the most efficient per target player that goes downfield, that was number five in consistency, that scored eight times last year, and I think he's being left for dead. I mean, the, the the reports out of camp right now in Miami, regardless of whether you think it will be consistent, is that the, here's what you need to know. Miami will not have the same offense this year that they had last year. Correct. Period. Whether Tua succeeds in executing that offense is not the same thing as saying you're going – you're not going to go out there with all out routes and underneaths. They are stretching the ball down the field. It will come with some pain, 
but you don't care about that. What you care about is that Will Fuller is being targeted down the field because he's the best at it. And so I think in the eighth round, you're looking at a player that you might be able to even get later in certain leagues. He may just slip because nobody wants to draft a guy there that they can't even play week one. Um, the red flags are the injuries and coming back from, from the injuries. But I am just very excited about the value that is provided late in the eighth round with Will Fuller. When I was uh, re-scouting Tua this offseason, went back, watched some film to see if I believe or don't believe, and I didn't believe, I, I honestly, every time he would throw a deep ball and it didn't connect to Jakeem Grant, and I was like, yeah, it's not that good. I did have the thought, like, Will Fuller probably would have caught that. Like, <laughs> he's throwing to nobody's out there. So it's hard to know exactly how good Tua could have been had he had weapons, and now he's got weapons. So, um, And Will Fuller is obviously phenomenal. We just don't know how much of uh, his juice last year was – Juice, juice. Let me so. let me read uh, the comment I have just so that people have the offense. Because outside of Fuller, it matters to the offense. Eric Rowe said uh, out of Miami last year, I noticed his playbook was condensed. This is their safety uh, to slants and bubbles. They really wouldn't let him show his arm. Now in training camp, it's deep routes. They're allowing him to throw it deep. That's what we need, and they've equipped him. So we've said it. This will be the. Uh, you know, assuming he gets these players back, yeah, um, that it's not just Albert Wilson making camp highlights, but Waddle, Fuller, Parker, Wilson. This is going to be a very fun thing to watch in Miami to see if he can do it. All right, my next mid round madness player, yeah. and I am telling y'all, yeah, y'all sleeping. I I am. I had a uh, my Zequel. Mm-hmm. Oh, not, I'm, not, I'm, not a sponsor, and you are you are not rousing me. Ooh, I rousing am, the slightest. I am, Rouse him. <laughs> when I say y'all sleeping, I'm not talking about the listeners. I'm talking about y'all. Yeah. I'm talking about Mike and Andy. You're sleeping on Travis Etienne. He's a fifth round pick right now, and here is what we know about Travis Etienne. Here, here's here's the whole reason why Travis Etienne is not being talked about as as a great fantasy pick. James Robinson. End of end of list. Mm, I would say. Oh, Urban. tell me more. I yeah, would say I, I Urban other, Meyer. I have other reasons. You you think Urban Meyer, who wants to run the ball like crazy, yeah. is the reason to uh, not like their running back? I actually don't agree with Mike on that. My my point. Okay, be, what's your one? Uh, he's he's a rookie. Okay, so, so, so not acc acclimation. Not my like Mike brought up yesterday in the studio. He's like. This could look a lot like Miles Sanders' rookie year, right? Elite second round pick, mm -hmm. uh, and very much late late season uh, comes on quick. I'm like, I, I completely agreed. I was like, that's exactly what I think will happen. Like I've watched camp and I see James Robinson being used. I think Etienne will catch a ton of passes, but I think it will come back out of the year. Literally, that's that's that is what I what I think. I think it's going to be a Miles Sanders situation, and I'm saying. That's a good pick in the middle rounds. You might have to hold off for a couple of weeks until he really takes over. But keep in mind, Miles Sanders finished his rookie year as the running back 15. And most of that came in the second half when he really helped and dominated for fantasy. That's going to happen this ETN's year. ETN's drafted as the RB24, just to put that right. with that 15 that you said. So he is, he is drafted as the running back 24. Over the last decade, there's only been five rookie running backs who have 150 rushing attempts and 50 receptions. All of them were top 15 running backs, Miles Sanders being one of those. I did not, I did not, stat, I, I did not know this stat until after... I checked what I had given Etienne, and he's just over both of those numbers. The reality is James Robinson was talked up pre-NFL draft, that he's, he's great, we're so happy to have him, and they spent a first-round pick on an electrically talented running back. Oh, he's got so just, much electricity. <laughs> just so happens to have been the college teammate of Trevor Lawrence. They've already said in camp that he is the clear safety blanket for Lawrence. He's targeting him all the time. There was news about him uh, being used as a wide receiver, lining up at wide receiver. ETN came out and said, no, I'm not. He's like, I'm just getting in as much work as I can. I do all the running back stuff. I do all the wide receiver stuff. He is super involved. Through the first week of camp, who got more uh, carries with first team? Was it uh, James Robinson or ETN? It was split. It was 50-50. You didn't even give me a chance. I didn't want you to be he able was, to he answer. He was kind of setting us up like anyway. We didn't need to answer. This was rhetorical. 
My point is this. Here is a but you first it. round. That's not rhetorical. <laughs> Here's a first. Yeah, I guess if Let's you see, he was wait, talking wait. to himself. <laughs> Hold on. Wait. If you answer here. your own rhetorical question, is it not rhetorical? No. Then? Wow. <laughs> is it, I, I believe the definition of a rhetorical question means unanswered. There, right? There's no answer. Interesting. Okay. Well, it wasn't rhetorical. So it what was, do we what do we call this when I ask a question but I answer it before I you know. have a chance? What do we call that? That's that's got to be arrogance. Yeah, arrogance. This pompous. is an arrogant question. <laughs> but oh, every single year there Leading are the two witness. rookie yeah, that- running backs who finish on average as a running back one. Nobody is doubting the talent. He is Why going- is he talking to us, Mike? I'm not opposed <laughs> to any of this. He is. Why is he talking to me? You can you can take your ears Help out and don't me. you don't even have to listen. Um you know, he's one of those guys that uh he was drafted as a first round talent because he is really really good and he's a great pass catcher, which is great for fantasy. The second half of this year, he's going to be a league winner. So you're going to have to if you draft him There's your headline. That's if, what, that's the that's the most important thing you've said. Thanks. That but that's my that is the point of of drafting Travis Etienne. If you grab him, you have to hold on to him. You probably won't start him the first couple of weeks. And at the end of the year, you have a better chance of winning a championship because you're going to have a difference-making, awesome fantasy asset at a very difficult-to-get position. And as we move to Mike's final mid-round madness pick, I will say this. like That is one of the mis... I guess the things that we can make mistakes on as fantasy players is... If Travis Etienne is the running back 15 from week eight on, and he's the running back 60 from weeks one through eight, that will distort because all you look at is end of year numbers. Like you win a championship by having a player that that goes on a run over the back half of the year, like a Miles Sanders did, like a Jonathan Taylor did, like a lot of these rookies do. Like, would you consider Etienne inevitable the way we talk about Javante Williams? Yes, inevitable, but the uh, having drafted Miles Sanders his the rookie year it it creates a quite a conundrum for you of you drafted in the fifth round you're playing him week one like that's that's happening I, I can't imagine you spend a fifth round draft pick for a player that you're going to bench uh, immediately and you are watching Miles Sanders you know not be the guy over and over and and you've now used the fifth round you've You've spent a huge opportunity cost when you could have had, uh, you know, like Cooper Cup, Deontay Johnson, Tyler Lockett in the fifth round. Uh, that's that's my that's my biggest problem with ETN is that he he is a fifth round pick, and I don't top of the fifth. And, and even if he takes over by the second half, I have the the opportunity cost to my team was tremendous for that first half roster construction wise I would agree with you I almost always load up you know at least two solid running backs in those first two rounds if 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 not uh three over three uh, because I love the wide receivers in these rounds but if you're looking for a running back in the middle rounds you ended up going early on Devonte Adams and Tyree Kill or those type of assets this is the running back I would so take. you would draft Travis Etienne over Chase Edmonds yes okay all right, let's let's enter a safer space here, at least for myself here, with Mike's last mid round pick. Um, I don't disagree with you at all about Travis Etienne. Oh, thanks. But I mean, you just started. You said I'm talking to us. You talk. Well, to us. I mean, Mike. You know, yeah, was you can talk. Me okay, some, some you can talk to me. So talk let's let's it. close this out with uh, what I think. Just a great pick, Mike. Just thank you. I'm on board. If you want to know, there's two players that I've really tried to get this off season in a dynasty league. Uh, one of them's Elijah Moore, wide receiver for the Jets. The other one is this guy. Is Damian Harris starting running back for the New England Patriots? Currently going in the back of the seventh. More importantly, the running back thirty-two. He is a starting running back, and he is being drafted as the thirty-second running back. And for Damian Harris, you have to remember the the story. Remember what was happening with him last off season. Out of training camp, it was getting louder and louder. The noise coming from the beat reporters saying, Harris is looking excellent. Harris Harris is probably going to start for this team. And that was back when we you didn't know if Sony Michelle still had anything. But it was clear uh, towards the end of training camp that Harris was going to be the guy. Finger injury. He is out until week four. Comes back in that first game, he he's off of injury. 
100 rushing yards. So in his time, because he also got hurt at the end of the season, unfortunately, we had we saw 10 games of Damian Harris and 14 opportunities a game. He was a top 24 option in five of the 10 games. And the, the argument against Damian Harris, no touchdowns. Half of his games, he was a top 24 uh, running back, and he did that with only two touchdowns. And what's an interesting thing here for Damian Harris, last year when he came in, weeks 4 through 11, Rex Burkhead, sexy Rexy was still there, and Rex Burkhead actually outsnapped Damian Harris. Now, to me, that's really not that wild because Rex Burkhead is a versatile running back where the, we're not looking at Damian Harris as a pass catcher. We're looking at him as a two-down thumper. Rex Burkhead was a very versatile player that Bill Belichick clearly valued, but as soon as uh, Rex Burkhead went down to injury, you saw Damian Harris' snap share rise from, from 35% all the way to 50% uh, of the snaps. What did they do in the offseason? They added two starting tight ends. You gave Hunter Henry a bunch of money. You gave Jonu Smith a bunch of money. What does that tell me? They're going to be in two tight end sets the majority of the season. They're going to be in a – what you can pass out of it, but this is a run-heavy formation. And you now you have Bill Belichick talking even greater things about Damian Harris, talking about how he's improved from year one to two. And now, in Bill Belichick's words, quote, he has an opportunity to really compete for the lead spot. I've been impressed with the commitment that he's shown. Those words from Bill Belichick? That's very high praise for somebody like Damian Harris, and I think you're going to get a ton of volume. You're not getting a top 10 running back unless something happens at the goal line with Cam Newton not taking the those goal line carries. Maybe Mac Jones gets in, which right now it's still a very tight competition, like it sounds from uh, out of New England. But I, the volume at the back of the seventh for a running back who can be a a – running back two for you, a spot started for you. I think he is a tremendous pick. Well, I agree. I mean, I've, I've tried to acquire him, and I think he's going to – I just believe that the Patriots are going to see improvement on offense. They're going to be better on offense and defense, which they're, the improvement on defense will improve their running game. Yeah, and I just think that, you know, even if they're not a top their volume, 10 offense, they, if you're in the, you know, 11 to 15 range, that just means – and he's healthy – I just think there's going to be a lot of volume there. And, and one of the things, all of us haven't projected for 230 plus carries this year. That's a ton of carries for Damian Harris. Only eight running backs had that last year. All of them were top 15 running backs. So um, obviously that's not necessarily going to come true with the lack of pass catching or, or rushing touchdowns. But he could be a baby Nick Chubb in New England. Could he, be. Well, the difference is Nick Chubb was a touchdown machine. I mean, this is just touchdowns from, you know, you, you two are in on Damian Harris. I'm out, but not on the talent. I've been a longtime supporter of Damian Harris from, from Alabama. I love the player. I just think if you don't catch the ball, and he does certainly does not project to be utilized in the passing game at all, um, then you got to score touchdowns. And if he is getting vultured, then it's like, okay, you're going to get a lot of yards. He could. But, but you might be okay with that, right? In the uh, seventh round? Couldn't you be okay with 100-yard games, double, uh, digit, double digits from the running back I mean, position? If, if he averages 100 yards a game, yeah, you'd be happy with that. I'm saying five of his 10 games, he was a top 24 running back. And Without his, touchdowns. And his volume, is, his, his attempt volume will go up this year with his snaps going up and Rex Burkhead gone. He, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do realize that. I looked at that, and he, he, he had a lot of those top 24s, but they, they weren't usually that good. During that stretch, in fact, taking out his last, I think it was week 14, through, uh, through week – um, from four to thirteen, his best stretch um, on a per game basis, he was the running back thirty four. Even though he had those finishes, because he never really did much. So I, I mean, look, if he gets the touchdowns, he's gonna have the yards, he's gonna have the opportunity, and he's talented. The offense could be better. I just, I really want to either know I, I'm getting touchdowns or or receptions, and well, I worry about both. This is a late pick, Jason. David Johnson or Damian Harris. I have drafted David Johnson over Harris. Ronald Pass Jones catcher. or Damian Harris? Ronald Jones. Michael Carter, Damian Harris. Michael Carter. I guess I'm really out. You really are. Wow. Out. Sorry. All right. Um, that's going to do it for Mid-Round Madness. Uh, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. And, um, you know, for the Foot Clan out there, for the new listeners, we really appreciate it when you guys support our sponsors. Mm -hmm. Like, this show has been the exact same format for the last six years, like where 
we have sometimes uh, one ad before the show, and then we have two ads in the middle of the show, and that's been the format we've kept to for years, and it helps us uh, support all of our employees and the staff, and it's really how the podcast rolls. And so we've had some great sponsors. We've heard from a lot of you, and so we want to thank them right now as we close things out. I want to thank Traeger Grills. Yes, um, we do. New oh, sponsor yeah. for this year, one that we've we've been uh, Traeger people for a long time, well before uh, their sponsorship. Uh, so we're very excited about them. Uh, you can fire up that wood-fired grill. Check out all of their options at Traeger.com slash footballers. You can grill and smoke and bake and roast and braise and barbecue. That's what is different about the Traeger for me, which I quickly found out, is you can do essentially all of your cooking. Yes, on at a trigger. I've I, like I put bacon on a on a pan and I, I smoked up some bacon. Like this is, it's not just a grill. I mean, Burger it's, a, it's a very versatile oh, machine. Yes. My, we have ours on the side of our house where you can't see it through the window, but with the Wi-Fi technology, my wife can check her phone and know what the temperature's at and know how things are cooking. So. Uh, big fan of Traeger. You can check them out at traeger.com slash footballers. And then we, of course, want to thank Pristine Auction. Uh, if you are looking for some sports memorabilia, favorite players, maybe you need something to show off when you go to your draft about, you know, I asked the question on Twitter yesterday about your hero. Who was the hero from last year? Who, by the Which, way. Which, yeah, thank you for tagging me, everybody, in that post. Oh, these were <laughs> players. Sorry. Oh, well, the people couldn't they stop still tagging tagged me. You. Yeah. No, but James Robinson came up a lot. You know, like maybe you need some James Robinson swag. Javonta Williams signed jersey up there for 46 bucks right now. Nick Chubb, newly re signed. You can grab his jersey, 52 bucks. Hundreds of daily auctions. Use the code BALLERS and get a $10 credit at pristineauction.com. All right, that'll do it for today's show, but never fear. There's another one tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in to the Fantasy Footballers, supporting the show, reviewing it, subscribing. We'll catch you tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.